Hello and welcome to today's Partner Infopedia web conference. This is Fast Track Dynamics 365 for Operations Tech Talk. Today's topic, financial reporting. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Principal Program Manager Lead, April Olson, Escalation Engineer, Kelly Biala, and Software Engineer, Chris Biesman. So without any further delay, April, the floor is all yours. Great, thank you. Well, welcome to today's Fast Track um, Financial Reporting. Um, today, the agenda we're going to cover is I'll briefly step through using financial reporting, the setup that is needed from within operations. I'll cover some of the features in the report list and then talk about the Click Once Designer. Um, when I'm done, I'm going to hand it over to Kelly, who will talk about LCS troubleshooting, and he'll step you through some of the common questions that we get around finding and applying hot fixes, looking for knowledge base articles, and general troubleshooting. Um, we'll also hand it over to then Chris, um, I think in the opposite order there. Um, we will, he will talk about resetting the data mart um, in a user uh, test environment, how to reset it, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about logging a service case versus a support case, and then we'll touch on the roadmap. So if we're using the financial reporting today, we'll start from within operations. And the financial report setup is found in the general ledger area. So by navigating to general ledger, under the ledger setup, you will see a financial reporting setup. Now the financial reporting setup is designed to allow you to pick what financial dimensions that you want integrated into our data mart for use in the financial reporting experience. This feature was introdu introduced in um, our app fall release, so if you are on our early RTW release, you may not see this menu item, but you will as soon as you upgrade. Now, when you are in the financial reporting setup window, you'll see a list of all the available dimensions and the selected. Now, some customers report on all their financial dimensions and some only want a few, and this is a global setting. So when you do make your selections, and this is something that you would want to do um, in the very beginning of your implementation, you'll want to select what financial dimensions and you can add them over to the list and you can change the order by using the up and down arrows. So I'm going to go ahead and add business unit department and cost center. So now when you do this, um, these will be the financial dimensions that are available. Um, today you will need to, in your user access environment, need to do a reset of the data mart, which Chris will cover um, in a few minutes. Um, we are hoping to, for spring, allow you to be able to add the financial dimensions without having to reset the data mart, but when you want to remove them, um, that is always going to be some service request you have to do, or if you're in a test environment, you can do that yourself, because we are essentially removing combinations and data from an existing data mart. The second tab on the financial reporting setup is the attributes. And there are two attributes that we allow you to choose. It's the include the vendor and the customer attribute. And the reason that we call these two out are they do have implications um, on the integration. Um, you can have a large amount of vendors and customers. So if this is really crucial for your reporting, um, we definitely want you to make sure you click yes for including them. But if for some reason um, they're not crucial and you don't want the extra data and processing, you can certainly click them to no, um, and then they will not be included in financial reporting as a design attribute. So once you've um, set up, we have a series of around 20 default reports that you can find in our financial reports list. And the financial reports list can be accessed from the general ledger menu, from the budgeting menu, and from the consolidations menu. Now when you go ahead and open up the list, you'll notice there is a tree structure over on the left. And this tree structure will show you the default report definitions. That's a folder that comes from our designer. And you'll see the lists that are included in that folder. 
So as you begin to implement and design your own reports and organize your reports, you may have many different folders here that you can collapse and expand. So for example, you may have a folder for your consolidated reports or your board level reports or maybe just your internal profit and loss reports. Um, so however you choose to organize your uh, reports and folders from the report designer, that will come across and you will see that list here in the report list. So these are the default reports, and when you want to view a report, um, I'll just walk you through a couple of the items um, as they are today, and then I am going to call out a couple of things that will be changing for our upcoming release, and I can elaborate a little bit on them again at the end of the session in the roadmap. So today, um, on the version that you are, you're currently using, when you click a report and you click view, if there is not a report version here, it's going to generate that report for the existing date. Whereas if you select an existing one and click view, it's going to open that particular report. So if I wanted to go ahead and uh, view this 1231 of 2016, it's going to open the one that was generated for that date and I would be able to see my report. Um, from the previous reports list, you notice that you can go ahead and select all. So you can do um, selecting, you can do some sorting by the different generation date and so on. Now once you're within the version of a report, there are a few options across the top that your users can do to explore the data. We have drill down capabilities. So wherever you see that there is a hyperlink, you can drill down to the account level of the report. And you'll notice that when you want to drill further into the transaction level, which is a setting that the end user chooses when they're designing that report, so this particular default report does have it generate with transaction level, you'll notice there are two options. One will open up the account transactions within operations, so it will navigate to that window and show you all the transactions for that particular account. Or you can drill down right within the report itself, and that will show you the transaction level details within this report and not bring you back to that operations window. Other experiences that you have within our viewing experience, um, if you click on the show, you can show headers and footers. If you wanted more real estate, you may want to hide those. Um, or you can collapse your summary line, so maybe you want to look at a real high level of the report before drilling into the detail. There are some interactions you can take with the show menu. Um, you'll notice the reporting tree is grayed out. Um, you can add a reporting tree to any of our default reports or any of the custom reports that you create. When you have one, that would be available for selection, and you could expand that and navigate to the different levels of the report. Of course, we have the different Zoom. Um, publish, what Publish is for is, let's say it's at the month end, um, I'm the accounting manager, and I'm posting some adjustments. Um, and when you're in month end, there's a lot of adjustments happening. They're happening frequently, and you want to be able to refresh your report. So I might post a couple of adjustments to my expenses. I may hit refresh so that I can see the report um, data reflected by those adjustments. Well, once I'm comfortable with the stage of the report, I would have the ability to publish that report. So when I'm refreshing, that's a personal view only, but when I'm want to make sure everyone else can see it, you know, maybe I'm saying the month is finally closed, I could go ahead and publish that. And then it would go ahead and process that request. All right, a couple other things I'll call out is the currency. Um, this is really um, performing the currency translation based on the setup that you have in your main account. Um, based with your currency translation type and your exchange rate type. And really what this allows you to do is when I go ahead and choose the Great British Pound, it's going to look at each main account on that report, use the settings assigned to that main account within main operations, and it's going to translate that data. So you'll notice this is going to take a second to process because there are quite a few different rules happening. And then once it's finished processing, I will see that report now displaying in Great British Pounds. Okay, and there we go. 
You'll notice the currency there. So I'll just go back to US dollars. Um, moving further to the right, um, a lot of these are very self-explanatory, but I have the ability to export the report. Um, I can print it. And then the last thing I can do is I do have some report options. So I could add an attribute. Maybe I wanted to see um, some transactions for a specific date. I'm going to cancel that export, but you can see it does pop up. Or I might want to say, OK, show me the sales for only my auto business unit. I could add a dimension filter. Um, if I wanted to, I'd have a list of dimensions here based on what I selected, and I could do that as well. So you have quite a few interactions right here within operations for those reports. Now we know that the default reports are great, but they're certainly not going to meet the needs for everyone. You're going to need to add reporting trees and customize those reports for your organization. So I'm going to go back to the report list. So here's my report list. You can see that's my new one that I published. And drawing your attention up to the menu items, you'll notice that we have new and edit. So what new will do, both new and edit are going to launch what's is called our click once designer. Um, that's going to have you log in. I'm going to click on new. And when I log in, it's going to launch that designer. And I will have to enter my credentials. Okay, so it just showed up on my other monitor. I'm going to enter my credentials. And that designer is going to launch. Now, because I clicked new, it's going to open me into a new report definition within the designer. Had I selected edit, it would have taken the report that I had highlighted, which is the 12-month trended income statement, and it would have opened up the report report designer with that particular report open. So all the building blocks would show. But because I clicked on new, you'll notice everything's blank here. I am now in that designer, and I can begin my modification experience. So the session isn't really to train on designer. So let me call out a couple of things that we want to share. About the clicks once design experience. just jump to that slide. So we have had a few questions on how to troubleshoot if that report designer doesn't launch. And a couple of things is that on Internet Explorer and Edge, you may want to add it as a trusted site. So if you go to Internet Explorer and then your Internet Options and then click on the Security tab, you can go ahead and add that URL that you're accessing as a trusted site, and then you can set that level to either medium, low, or low. Um, it's recommended because that Click Once Designer is something that you need to launch every time you go into that design experience that you do disable any pop-up blockers in your browser. Um, otherwise, that won't show up. And it also works well for some of the Excel um, pop-ups as well. Um, if you are a Chrome user, there is a Click Once plugin that you need. So if you just go to the Chrome Web Store, you'll need to just search on Click Once um, and install that plugin for that designer to launch. So um, if you're a Chrome user, that will be crucial to do. And then the last one is something that um, gets quite a few users, and we experience it internally um, actually doing a lab as well, so it even catches us. So it's a great idea to make sure that that .NET version on your machine is at 4.6.2. So that is the minimum .NET framework version that is needed for the Click Once Designer experience. So that's just to give you a quick overview on the setup that is needed and how to interact with the viewing experience in operations, and then, of course, how to click the once, click once designer to start the design. I'm now going to hand it over to Chris, so it's a little bit different than the slide deck that we uh, shared, but Chris is now going to talk a little bit about the Datamart and how to reset it, and when we recommend that you do and you do not. So, Chris, the floor is yours. Thanks, April. Um, as April mentioned, um, yeah, okay, I'll switch these slides. 
Um, as April mentioned, um, my name is Chris, and I'm an engineer on the financial reporting team. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the data mart and what it means to reset it. Uh, but first, we'd like to give a little bit of an overview of how financial reporting uh, is laid out uh, in an installation. And the example that's on the screen is for what you might see in a production environment, but this could all be um, combined onto one machine in the case of, of a demo environment. Um, so first, we have the BI machine. And on the BI machine is where the financial reporting process service lives. And the process service is responsible for um, doing the processing when you have clicked to generate or view a report. And it pulls information from the um, management reporter database or data mart uh, in order to do that. And it's also responsible for syncing uh, the information from the AX database into the data mart for the reporting purposes. Um, the AOS machine uh, contains the financial reporting application service, and that is hosted underneath IAS um, and the uh, AOS website. So the financial reporting application service is responsible for uh, dealing with any interactions with the UIs. So anything that you interact with in the web client will make requests to our application service. And the experience in the Click Once designer uh, connects to the application service as well. Uh, the application service uses the um, management reporter database uh, in order to manage its information. So that was just a little bit of an overview to give you some landscape. Um, some details about the data mart itself. Um, as I mentioned, it's used to generate the financial reports. And the data that it uses has been synced from the operations database over to um, the data mart using the process service. Um, this uses a technology called uh, SQL Server Change Tracking. And it uses uh, tokens that are set up in the AX database um, in order to determine what data has changed. Uh, one thing that's important to note is the retention policy on this change tracking is a three to six day retention policy. So when you're resetting the data mart, the things that it does is clears out all of the information that came so that it can be brought over um, once again. So there's tables in the data mart itself that are cleared out, except for some versioning information. Um, there's also a couple tables in the actual financial reporting database that relate to the operations database, such as companies and users. And there are a couple tables in the operations database itself uh, related to the reports list and the reports versions. Uh, so one of the things we wanted to talk about with regards to Data Mart Reset is when you would consider resetting the Data Mart versus when you wouldn't. And this is somewhat specific to your UAT or sandbox environments where um, a partner or customer would have access to do these operations um, against databases. So uh, when not to reset the Data Mart, um, if the financial reporting database and the operations databases have been restored to the same points in time or they have been copied together, there isn't usually a need to um, reset the data mart uh, because the expectation is these uh, change tracking information have remained intact uh, during that process. If you're just testing out general functionality in the uh, testing environment, and you don't really care that the data is exactly um, the same as it might have been, say, in a production database, then you can still use financial reporting even if the databases were not in sync. You just would not expect the um, numbers on the reports to necessarily match um, in that 
situation. Um, if you find that you have incorrect data on your reports and you don't actually know the cause, we don't recommend a data mart reset as the first line of defense. Um, that's when you'd want to reach out uh, to support in order to help uh, determine why the data didn't uh, look as expected. So when do you want to reset? Um, if you're only restoring the operations database, but you kept the financial reporting database in place, then you would want to reset uh, the data mart so that you get the same data that represents the copy of operations that you've restored. Um, if the financial reporting process service has not been running for more than those three to six days uh, that the retention policy is set up on, you would also want to do a data mart reset um, in order to avoid uh, duplicate data or to make sure that things stay in sync again. And that's the same as if uh, something has happened to your database so that all the change tracking information is lost. Um, if you've made massive changes to the operations database outside of a normal process, such as um, custom SQL scripts, that may also require you to reset the data mart. And as April mentioned, when you're doing removing dimensions in the financial report setup, uh, that's also another scenario where when we do uh, recommend a data mart reset. So I'll switch to my desktop and do a little bit of a demo about doing a data mart reset. So right now I'm in my, um, essentially my AOS environment, and I have gone to the install directory where financial reporting has been set up. In this case, it's just on my C drive. It's the financial reporting folder. Um, in most cases, it's going to be on a servicing drive if you're looking in a UAT environment. And what I want to do is go to the server folder and the MR deploy folder. And this is where we have our PowerShell scripts that control doing a data mart reset. We will import the module that contains the data mart reset. This is the mrdeploy.psd1. After we've done that, we can run the reset data mart integration command. And there are a couple mandatory parameters to this. One of them is reason. A reason currently has three values that you can tab through, um, bad data, other, or servicing. So a lot of times you may such as um, restored the operations database. And these are the only required information. Everything else will be read from the config files that you have on your systems. And uh, other thing to note with those parameters, those are uploaded to telemetry so that we can get more information about uh, when the data mart is reset and, and why. So you notice there's a warning that tells you that the data mart is being reset. So your data will, will be um, cleared out and reintegrated. And you must also stop the process service on all the machines that it's installed on before continuing. So in this case, I just have one machine, so I'm going to stop my process service. You may have more than one BI machine, and you'll want to go to each one of them to stop the process service so that it doesn't bring data in uh, during the reset process. Um, now I'll accept the warning message. And at this time, the tables were all cleared out. And now that the command is returned back, it means that the tables are empty. And I can go back and start the process service. Once the process service is started back up, you can go into your SQL. Um, and you can select the management reporter database 
and run this type of a query, which is selecting from the scheduling.task state table and the scheduling.task table. This lists the different things that are in progress. So we can see basically most of these um, information are still in process of syncing. And as that happens, we'll see fewer and fewer of those on the list until the list is empty, which represents that the reset has been completed and you can run financial reports again. Um, and the states that are on here, um, state three means the map is currently running. So uh, bringing your transactions over is one of the ones that takes the longest. Uh, five means that it has completed normally, which we're filtering out. And seven means it completed with errors. And it's normal to expect one transient error, and that would be expected to go away. But if you have many errors, that may be a situation where you will have to contact support. I'll go ahead and switch back to the uh, slide deck here. So basically, I've walked through the content of this slide, which is preparing for the reset, running the reset. And after the reset, um, the notes are basically that it takes a little bit of time for that data to sync back. On the UAT environments, we have um, usually lower tiered databases, which means that the reset is going to take a longer amount of time. And that's normal just because uh, you would be on a lower tier in order to save costs on those environments. I will transition over to Kelly with a note that if you suspect you've run into a bug, this is when you would want to log a support case. Um, if you don't see reports, if you see reports with incorrect amounts, you would also want to log a support case rather than necessarily resetting the data mart unless you know that you've done one of the things that would require a data mart reset. And with that, I think I will transition back to Kelly. All right, thanks, Chris. Let me take over screen here. And let's go back a few. All right, so um, what I'm going to look at and uh, go through an overview of is uh, where we can find financial reporting hotfixes at uh, through LCS, and then uh, highlight a few of the fixes in these uh, in the most recent hotfixes that we've run into on support a lot um, that can help you out if you get these applied so you don't run into the issues. I'm also going to look at um, the starting process of, of how you would actually apply one of these financial reporting hotfixes, uh, depending on the environment type. And then we'll go into some specific examples of how you can dig up information in the LCS logs about um, possibly a financial reporting issue, or you suspect there's an issue in, in the environment that is causing some issues with financial reporting. So let me share my screen here. All right, so um, I have uh, LCS up here, and I'm logged in on the left. You should see an issue search. And so uh, it's easy as uh, typing in financial reporting hotfix and doing a search, and it's going to pull up uh, a list of relevant financial reporting hotfixes. Um, and so if we take a look at um, kind of the three latest uh, in the last three months are uh, hotfix three, four, and five. So I'm just going to pull up um, financial reporting hotfix three. And so uh, one, of, one of the main things we've seen from the support side uh, is uh, some issues with exporting to Excel uh, and some performance issues. Um, currently, a user uh, may generate a report for transaction detail, 
uh, similar to what uh, April had went into on the example with the drill into the transaction detail, and they may export it um, somewhat unknowingly that they're going to export all the transactions on the report, and it will, um, if it's a large enough report, that could be you know hundreds of thousands to millions of transactions that it's attempting to put into an Excel file, and so um, in this hotfix three. Uh, we improved uh, the uh, memory consumption on uh, exporting, and so that uh, issue is pretty much taken care of. I think in, in a future release, we're looking at uh, notifying or having a, a dialog box for the user when they export, and so uh, typically they probably don't want that many transactions in an Excel file anyway, and so that should allow them to get around any sort of issues there. And so if we go back to, uh, if we take a look at Hotfix 4, Um, oops, sorry, grabbed the wrong one. Search hotfix for here. All right, so from the support side, some of the, the biggest issues that uh, we've seen this one fix is uh, the, the ledger or the uh, financial reporting setup screen that April demoed. Um, we had some issues where that wasn't functioning properly, depending on uh, whether or not you had, uh, it was a newly deployed machine on, on uh, Operation 7.1 version, or if it was a upgraded machine, and so that, that uh, this uh, Hotfix 4 fixes that. Um, we also had a number of fixes around uh, column and header alignment on the reports, on the output, in both the web viewer experience and the uh, exporting to Excel. And these hot fixes are uh, cumulative, so um, they'll show five here. So obviously, we want you to be on the latest and greatest five. We'll have all the fixes that we uh, previously have talked about. So this one was mainly uh, it's pretty short and simple here, but um, we had performance improvements uh, for generation of reports and uh, the integration. So uh, we saw some. Um, performance issues with larger uh, batches of transactions that were being integrated from the operations database. And so this uh, update five uh, does a good job at getting rid of those concerns. All right, so next thing we're going to look at is, so what do I do? Uh, what's, what are the first steps I can do to uh, apply one of these hotfixes? So I'm going to take the KB number here. Switch, switch windows here. All right, so I have the KB number. Um, I'm looking at my LCS project page here. I have my environments on the right. Um, I'm going to look at applying this update to my sandbox environment. So I'm going to go to full details. All right, so there's a lot of information in here, but uh, for update purposes, uh, we can scroll all the way down to the bottom. There are these tiles that uh, basically represent which updates we can apply to the environment. And so uh, these financial reporting hotfixes, these roll-up hotfixes are binary updates, so I'm going to click that. and paste in that KB number and do a search. So it's going to pull up that uh, update five. So then I would have to download the binary file. And I won't go through that step. Um, so after the, the binary file is downloaded, uh, let me go back a few pages here. There's there's a number of um, different ways that you can apply the fix, depending on what type of uh, what type of environment it is. So there's uh, production, there's a sandbox, there's uh, there's demo environments, there's uh, you can download a VHD and, and you could be demoing uh, 
Dynamics 365 for operations. So uh, for this, probably the easiest way um, for a prod or sandbox environment, if I go back to um, let me go back to the full details on my sandbox. So the first thing that you need to do after you downloaded that binary file is you need to upload it to your asset library in LCS. And then once it's in there, go back to my full details on my sandbox environment. So once it's in there at the top, there's this uh, maintain and you can apply an update and choose the software deployable package that we would have uploaded to our asset library. And so for sandbox, this, this just goes through, it'll you know apply it automatically. For prod, you're gonna have to fill out some more information uh, such as uh, downtime, uh, scheduled downtime. Um, and so basically it involves our engineering team in that process. Uh, and so uh, that's how you would apply one of the financial reporting hotfixes. Also, there's a wiki page. Let me grab the link here. It's in uh, the slides. So this is all these different options and, and for the different types of environments are covered in this uh, wiki page, this technical concepts guide and under the service environments section here. And so um, we go take a look at this, install a binary hotfix or install a deployable package. This is kind of the meat of the, the experience here. It walks you through uh, the different types of environments and what you can do. Uh, this uh, implementation project is what we've been looking at in this automatic automated package application is that maintain apply updates that we just looked at. And so there's a few environments where that isn't an option because you can't access that from, or it doesn't have an LCS page to even go to. Um, and so for those, if we scroll down further, uh, there's there's steps to uh, apply the, the package manually and you run through a few um, command line things. It's it's actually not, not too bad. Um, but this is linked on the slides and, and works for all all types of environments. Just need to find the the spot that you that applies to your environment. All right, so let's go back to, let's take a look at some of the ways that we can look at an environment and uh, either determine if, if something is um, wrong with the environment itself that's affecting financial reporting, or uh, we can also dig into some of the financial reporting logs to identify issues. So I'm gonna go look at my production environment. I'm going to scroll down to environment monitoring. So I'll just go uh, a few quick things here, go over a few quick things. Uh, so here we have, uh, things are, are mainly broken out by server in, in a lot of these environment monitoring uh, diagnostics. And so from the architecture standpoint that Chris went over, um, we have the uh, the AOS machines or machine AOS one here would have the financial reporting application service. That's typically it's just going to be the client communication. So there's not really going to be much load showing up on on that side of things for the financial reporting piece. What we mostly care about are these BI servers. So on production, you're going to have a financial reporting process service, which again handles the report generation and integration pieces. Uh, we're going to have a service on each one of these. And so that's where we're going to typically see uh, a lot of the processing occur in regards to financial reporting. Um, if we go look at the uh, health metrics tab here, there's just a few quick things that you can look at to check the environment. So we do have a uh, MR uh, section here that 
uh, and again, we're only mainly interested in the BI uh, machines at this point, uh, gives kind of a uh, CPU utilization or processor time view here. We can check for um, interesting spikes. And then uh, on the system tab, again, uh, we can see memory usage. Uh, and so I guess a kind of a real-world example where this might come into play is if um, we're generating, uh, you know, 10 large reports, uh, maybe we're exporting to Excel a bunch of different times, and so I would expect to see the memory available go lower here on the BI machines as that work is being done across the BI services. And same thing with the CPU utilization, uh, it would be expected to see spikes on that. Uh, for the SQL Insights, um, mainly interested in the uh, SQL Now tab. Uh, this will this only shows you uh, queries against the operations database, uh, so not against the data mart. But it still can be useful in troubleshooting and and, and uh, for example, um, maybe there's some other uh, large uh, operations processes going on, imports or or uh, whatnot that. Uh, are currently running, you'll be able to see them currently going here, and also uh, you'll be able to see maybe there's a uh, integration statement running that's being blocked by some of the operations processes. All right, so let's go back to let's go back to the environment monitoring, and we'll look at uh, some specific log examples and how you can use those to identify issues. So I'm going to go on to my sandbox environment, scroll down to environment monitoring, All right, so there's this view raw logs. I'm going to click that. So it takes me to uh, a screen here where I have a number of options of pre-built queries to run against uh, the all the machines in the environment. So if I open it up here, I have a few financial reporting queries. Um, some of these are more useful than others. We're reworking a number of these to make them more useful. Uh, let's take a quick look at financial reporting daily error summary. So this one, uh, unfortunately, the name needs to be changed. It's more of a um, depends on the environment, but it's basically a monthly uh, error summary here. So uh, first thing I did was I clicked show option, and I just increased the limit to the max, um, and then I'm going to click search. And so you can see it gives you a count of a number of error or a number of times that error has occurred. Uh, we have the build version, which is actually the uh, financial reporting version, which is uh, very helpful for support. And you can see though it doesn't give you any sort of uh, timestamp. It it gives you you know the error message. It doesn't give you a call stack, but uh, it's more for an overall view of the environment health. Um, and so to drill into specific issues, we have to take a look at a few of the other logs. So the other uh, query I'll cover under here is this um, financial reporting data flow. And so what this is going to show, let me set the time here. So it's going to be used for a number of things, but one of the uh, useful things it's, it can be used for is to know when a data mart reset is completed. And so as Chris showed, you, uh, there was a query that he had that you could run, uh, but again, that would be on like sandbox environments. But for prod, it's a little bit uh, trickier since you don't have access to SQL. So uh, this financial reporting data view can be used for that. So. So in this case, I happen to know that a data mart reset was kicked off around this time or this time frame. So I'm going to click 
quick search. All right, so we have a uh, timestamp and the name of the integration map. So the integration, of course, is broke out into uh, different maps depending on what type of data it's pulling over. And so uh, the quickest way to uh, identify if a data mart reset has uh, is completed or is very close to being completed is has it pulled over all your GL transactions because that's going to be the most time typically during the integration is pulling over all the GL transactions. So if I just sort by the changed column here twice, so I can see here. So um, I don't I don't know the exact time that the data mart reset started. We'll look at that in a second, but I can see here that uh, the General ledger transactions to fact, which is pulling all the transactions, completed at 17.10. And I know that just because this happens to be really close to the amount of GL transactions I have. And there's a few other here, but this is this is the most uh, useful for the data mart reset piece. This is the one you want to focus on. And then uh, from the support side, I guess we found to be this all logs to be the next most useful piece for identifying issues. Um, so it, it pulls back a lot. And so uh, what we have is a table here. Let me, uh, let me see if I can pull that up on the slides. I gotta switch the. Okay. So hopefully you can see a slide here of our all log search terms that we found to be helpful. So I'll, I'll go back to the box in a minute, but basically uh, the first column, the provider name, is also a search term, so it's text that we'll be putting into the filter box, as well as the third column. And so this, this table here can give you a breakdown, kind of give you a, a, a place to start if you're trying to troubleshoot an issue. So we'll make sure that's included um, somewhere after the, the session here that we can get access to that. So let's go through just a quick couple examples here. So for that data mart reset, uh, like I said, I, I wasn't quite sure what time that was started. So these will show up both in prod and uh, sandbox environments. Let me stretch this back just a little bit. So if I search, I type in the uh, data mart reset. A little bit bigger. The longer the uh, start and end date is on these, the longer they take. I probably should have uh, narrowed that down a little bit. OK, so pull back one record. I scroll to the right. Uh, I can see the event message, a request was logged to reset data mart. So I know it started at um, 1547. So if I wanted to get some more information about that uh, specific data mart reset again, I could use the data flow query that we looked at to tell when, when the uh, GL transactions to fact integration map completed. Or maybe, I'm, maybe I just posted 100,000 transactions and I want to know, did they, have they integrated yet? So uh, we can use a search term of... Uh, MR scheduler tasks and let me pull up the uh, text here on that. And add in the name of the integration map. And then something like that, the map task completed, that just happens to be because there's like a start and an end for some of these. So I'm going to search that. All 
All right, so um, we had a number of GL transactions to fact, records returned during that time frame, but uh, we have some columns that uh, help us, again, kind of uh, identify the one we're interested in or maybe we're interested in a, a high-duration high uh, run, but we have this uh, written column that we can sort. And so we get that. Here's a, a record for that initial integration, basically, the same amount of uh, GL transactions, and then you can see it took quite a long time. Uh, uh, it's in milliseconds, but still 4,797 seconds to complete that. And, and this is on, as Chris was mentioning, this is on Sandbox, so the, the durations are higher than we would expect on a prod environment. And then the last one I guess I wanted to cover really quickly here is uh, uh, long-running queries. So uh, any financial reporting query that takes longer than a second to execute is will show up in the logs here. And, and sometimes, again, that's uh, helpful. Um, it's not always, you know, indicates uh, a problem necessarily, but it can help you or help support narrow down the issues. Oops. And what uh, this also gives you the uh, query, of course, and and which is helpful in the sense that sometimes you don't know the issue: is it integration related or is it uh, reporting related? Uh, is this report taking a long time to generate uh, because it can't pull the um, or it's having trouble pulling uh, the number of dimension values, or is it because uh, there's a number of transactions that are being posted currently, and it and it's um, kind of hitting the performance on the server. So um, just yeah, just a quick uh, example here. So uh, we walked through uh, how to find issues in LCS, uh, how to apply them. Uh, I have a couple links again in the, the slides there to follow up on if you have more questions on how to apply the financial reporting deployable packages to environments. And then uh, we also covered how to troubleshoot uh, through the LCS logs. So I think I'll uh, hand it back over to April for the roadmap portion. All right. So there's a couple of things that I wanted to talk about um, as we wrap up the session here, and one is our Dynamics 365 roadmap. We have now made our roadmap publicly available. So if you just go to roadmap.dynamics.com, you can, on the application, choose Dynamics 365 for operations, and then you can further click further narrow down the list of results by financial management, and that's where you'll see some of the things that are in progress for all of financial management, but including financial reporting. Um, so I got a couple of questions in the feeds about what version I was showing and if there's any differences um, available. And one of the things that you saw was that financial report list with the folder structure. And that was something introduced through a hotfix um, after the fall release. Um, but there are some other things as well that are coming. Um, I got a question on the ability to delete financial reports um, and generating financial reports. And you will be able to do both of those come the spring release that we will be having, um, or the release that's later this summer. Um, so financial report dimension and deletion are going to both be available. Um, I can't remember which uh, one was introduced with if there was a hot fix or not. Kelly may have a better memory than I do <laughs> in those areas. But this is where you can watch for all the features that are coming across finance, including financial reporting. So definitely follow this website. And as we start to work on stuff, we will 
um, make sure you put it out there. Likewise, if you're interested in what was introduced in the last release, you can click on the what's new, and that will show everything that has been previously released based on the uh, selections that you make. So here you can see things with financial reporting. Um, here's a list of some of the things that were introduced. Um, the second thing that I wanted to call out are ideas. Um, ideas are the website ideas.dynamics.com. If you click on that, um, you'll notice there is a Microsoft Dynamics 365 for operations. And when you do this, um, you can see the different suggestions that have been added um, by the different areas of operations. So you can see for financial reporting, we've had two suggestions that have been logged. Um, we're just starting to roll out this ideas.dynamics.com. So this will be the new place for you to enter suggestions for Dynamics 365 for operations. Uh, so for those of you that are partners and working on previous versions of AX or Management Reporter, that will not be the suggestions here. That will still be the Connect site. But this will be for anything that you'd like to see in operations. Um, out here is where you will do um, enter those suggestions or as you can see vote um, and we'll go ahead and triage those so I actually put this in the public response earlier today um, about a comment on reporting currency so this is a great place to enter those and share with your customers uh, so with that I'm going to hand it back to Infopedia um, and that completes our uh, session today we will pause for a survey and some questions Great, thank you, April. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to take a moment and bring your attention to a link that I just posted in the uh, conversation pane. That's a link to a short survey for this web conference, and we ask that you please take a moment before logging out to access it. We hope that you found today's information helpful, and if you enjoyed today's web conference or have feedback on how we can provide you with a better event, this is your chance to let us know. The survey scores are on a scale from one to five, with five being the highest score possible. And with that, we're going to go ahead and conclude today's web conference. Attendees can access the web conference recording via the same registration site used for today's broadcast. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenters, April, Kelly, and Chris. And thank you, audience, for logging in and joining us today. This does conclude today's web conference, and you may now disconnect.